Thank you for this invitation. It's really a pleasure to be in the insulin and glycemic index city. So I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about old stuff, last century stuff, as, as it has been stated this morning, about the, the, the me metabolism and health effect of fructose. Uh, what can I get? OK, so I've got some uh, contact with the industry, not as much as I would like, though there is still some room <laughs> if you're interested. Uh, <clears throat> and I have one conflict of interest, is that I, I'm, I'm Swiss. And, and Swiss people have, have a special gene, which is <laughs> the neutral gene. So it's very difficult for, for us to say that something is black or white. <laughs> That's the way it is. So I changed a little bit the, 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 the title and added, or maybe it's both. It's fr friend and foo, or both, depends. If you look first at the white side, first let's um, just look at a very oversimplified view of, of, of type 2 diabetes. And type 2 diabetes comes from a mixture of a decreased insulin secretion and insulin resistance, and insulin resistance can be present at the, the level of the muscle, liver, and adipose tissue. Mixture of this causes hypoglycemia. It also causes hypotriglyceridemia. It decreases HDL cholesterol. It, it does a lot of other things, and that leads to long-term complication. That's mainly micro or macrovascular complications. So what, what does fructose do in, in this very broad scheme? So there are some well-known beneficial effects of fructose. And the first one is that compared to sucrose or starch, equivalent amount of fructose will cause less increase in, 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 in glycemia, less increase in insulin. And in type 2 diabetes mellitus, it has been well shown that it decreases HbA1c. So it improves uh, overall glucose homeostasis. And here you see the results of a, a meta-analysis uh, coming from the group of Toronto here. Now there are what is usually coined adverse effect of fructose. And the first one is that it may cause insulin resistance. Be careful, because when we talk about insulin resistance, you don't really know what we're talking about. Uh, more exactly, having a high amount of fructose in your diet will some, somewhat increase hepatic uh, glucose production, and it will impair the suppression of, of hepatic glucose production by insulin. So that's what is called decreased hepatic insulin sensitivity. The other thing, which is also quite well known, is that if you have a very high fructose diet or very high sucrose diet, it will or it may increase blood triglyceride concentration. Uh, that's what is illustrated here, and that's a dose-dependent effect. The, the, the more fructose you have in your diet, the more fasting and postprandial triglyceride increase. Uh, now, that's mainly observed with hypercaloric, high-fructose diet, and it, it, it requires a, a large amount of fructose in your diet. So we, you could see that fructose may have some beneficial effect in diabetes, in that it will decrease hypoglycemia, but possibly deleterious effect if it increases blood triglyceride and it, if it, <coughs> oh, I have a wrong uh, arrow, if it, if it decreases HDL cholesterol. Now, is it adverse effect? That's certainly an adverse effect if you have a very high increase in blood triglyceride concentration. Now, you have to be careful again, I mean, 
if, if you take care of a type 1 diabetic patient and he has very high ketone bodies level, that's certainly something ominous. Now, it doesn't mean that for each people who has a slight increase in ketone bodies, that's going to be something deleterious. I mean, there, there are physiological variations. And if you look at how fructose metabolism, maybe that, that, that can explain the, these effects. So you certainly know that all of your cells can use glucose. Most, not all, but most of the, your cells can also use fatty acids. So when you eat carbohydrates, and that's starch or glucose, you will absorb glucose. Glucose can be utilized in, 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 in those, your cells right away. For fructose, it's not the same thing, because fructose is not a constant uh, food in, in, in our diet. So uh, the nature has evolved that only a few tissues express fructose metabolizing enzymes. And that's mainly the liver, but also the gut and the kidney. And the role of these tissues will be to convert fructose <coughs> mainly into glucose and lactate, which can be directly used as energy substrate outside the liver, and to some extent into fatty acids. So the, the, the role of uh, the, the way you metabolize fructose compared to glucose is first convert it into glucose and fat, and then export it to be metabolized in, in other tissues. It comes at some cost, and you see on this slide that when you convert fructose into fatty acids, you will lose about 25% of its energy content as heat. And when you convert fructose into glucose, you will lose about 5%. Now, when, once you, you, you see the metabolism of fructose like that, it's, it's no major surprise that it somewhat increases hepatic glucose production. And I, I should say that it increases hepatic gl glucose production, but it does not increase fasting blood glucose. And it's not so much a surprise that it may also increase, to some extent, blood triglyceride concentrations. Now, you often read that fructose causes insulin resistance. That, that would be hundreds of papers stating that it's well known that fructose causes insulin resistance. As I showed you, it decreases a little bit hepatic insulin sensitivity without causing hyper, uh, hyperglycemia. When you look at whole body insulin resistance or whole body insulin sensitivity at high insulin levels, that is insulin-mediated glucose disposal, you see on this slide that even after four weeks on a, on a diet containing 1.5 gram fructose per kilo per day uh, in healthy subjects, you don't sh so sh see any difference in insulin-mediated glucose disposal. Now, if you look at the few studies which actually measured insulin sensitivity using eugly euglycemic hyperinsulinemic clamps, you certainly can't read this, but there are not so many studies having directly measured insulin sensitivity. Many of them described hepatic insulin resistance, but none of them showed any increase in, in uh, decrease in insulin-mediated glucose disposal at high levels, at the level of, of the muscle, except one French study which was specifically focused on, on subjects with metabolic syndrome and who were offsprings of, uh, of patients with type 2 diabetes. So there is obviously no <clears throat> reason to, 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 to believe in that there is no demonstration that a high fructose diet per se, independent of uh, changes in body weight, would cause insulin resistance. Now, We've seen the black and white part, and there is, of course, a gray part. And you certainly know that a high sugar diet or high fructose diet has been associated with the development of obesity. I don't know if it's causal or not, but quite often you have obese patients with a high sugar intake. Now, the, the consequence, metabolic consequence of obesity 
depend on, 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 on the, the nature, the location of uh, excess fat. And you s all know that uh, when you have abdominal fat deposition, you will have more risk of cardiovascular diseases, more risk of, uh, of, of diabetes than with subcutaneous fat. That has been very nicely demonstrated uh, a few years ago by Sam Klein in, uh, in St. Louis, in which he, in, in, in the left part of this slide, you, you see the insulin sensitivity in obese subjects before and after a liposuction, which removed a large portion of subcutaneous fat. And you see that removing subcutaneous fat doesn't change insulin sensitivity. At this time, Sam was thinking that taking off visceral fat would improve insulin sensitivity. On the right part, you see that it's not the case. I mean, that's a group of subjects who had uh, omentectomy, and he measured glucose tolerance before and after, and there was no difference. So that this led him to question whether visceral fat, per se, was, was responsible for insulin resistance. And he came up, came up with the, the, this study in which he compared group of subjects with similar excess body weight, but with different intrahepatic lipid concentration or different visceral fat concentration. And what he, he observed is that uh, more than visceral fat volume, intrahepatic lipid concentration is a major determinant of insulin resistance. So that leads to the question, would uh, a high fructose diet cause ectopic lipid deposition in the liver and possibly in other tissues? And may that be in the long term responsible for adverse effects? That's a question which remain open, so what we can say is that if you have a very high fructose diet and uh, associated with a high caloric intake, excess caloric intake, you can indeed increase intrahepatic lipid concentration within a, a few days. And you see here that with a 30% excess fructose, within a, a six-day period, you almost double intrahepatic lipid concentration in healthy subjects. When you double the intrahepatic lipid concentration in healthy subjects, you go from 1% to 2% fat in the liver, though you are, you're still far away from the 5 to 10% that you observed in, in uh, obese patients. But that's definitely of con uh, a concern. Now, we asked recently the, the, the other way around, I mean, if we take patients who subject with a high sugar con, uh, consumption and we decrease their sugar intake, will that change in hepatic lipid concentration? And that's a small subject which we, we had thought of including 60 overweight male and female subjects. And believe me or not, in Switzerland, it's difficult to find obese subjects for this kind of study, though we had to stop at 27. And maybe uh, we should continue the, the, this study in North America. Uh, and in this subject, all had a similar high uh, consumption of sh sugar sweetened beverage, and they were randomized after four week running periods to either go on with their sweetened beverage consumption or switch to artificially sweetened beverage. And I, I won't go into the detail of the study, but what we observed was that after two weeks, there was no difference in body weight, no difference in visceral adipose tissue, which you see on the, on the right, but there was uh, uh, about 25% difference, uh, decrease in intrahepatic fat content in subjects who, who were on artificially sweetened beverages. Now, what, what you see here is the individuals on the left side, the, the control group, and the uh, right side, the, the subjects randomized to artificially sweetened beverage. And you, you see that, that there is a reduction when you switch from sweetened beverage to artificially sweetened beverage. What you see also is that of these 
thir 13 or 14 subjects who all have a high sugar intake, almost half of them don't have any increase in intrahepatic fat content at the beginning. So the, the sugar intake by itself is certainly not <coughs> the single factor determining uh, intrahepatic fat content. And I can get to the conclusion, which is that, as all of you know, pure fructose compared to sucrose or starch decreased blood glucose and uh, hemoglobin, uh, HbA1c in, in, in type 2 diabetic patients. That would certainly be a beneficial effect. Uh, that it can increase fasting and postprandial blood triglyceride concentration that it can increase endogenous glucose production, but that these effects in healthy subjects are small, and it's difficult to know whether it's early deleterious effect or just adaptation to fructose feeding. And I would strongly insist that at, at the opposite of what you re really read quite often, there is no evidence that fructose directly causes insulin resistance at the whole body uh, level, at least not at the, at the muscle level. And finally, uh, there is some concern that in, uh, fructose may contribute to accumulation of intrahepatic uh, fat concentration, but that's uh, an issue which remains to be further evaluated. And I will end by thanking my collaborators here, the group in, in my lab. The, the dog is just for preclinical studies. And also my collaborators in Bern, uh, Chris Bush and, and Roland Kreis, who, who measure intrahepatic fat uh, using magnetic, magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And all my other collaborators, thank you for your attention.